Obviously, the first reaction is fire Kirk. Season's over. If you do that, you're going to miss out on this team. Welcome back to the NF Podcast, where we cover Iowa sports. Today, we're going to do a breakdown of the Iowa versus Iowa State game, uh, break down some of the big plays that happened, uh, some of the unforgivable actions that occurred, and then we're going to work into a preview of the Iowa Troy game. But that's mostly going to be a what do we want to see as a bounce back game? Yeah. And how does that, you know, give us a lens into what the rest of the season is going to look like? Yeah, it's more of like a wish list rather than a breakdown of Troy. Obviously, Troy starts 0 2. But to start with the Iowa State Iowa game, I mean, I think it takes a fan perspective and like a podcast perspective. We had one of our most viewed episodes last week. We had 5,000 views, the most comments and likes we've had, and the positivity and the momentum that we even shared in that podcast and the positivity we had about Cade and Lester. And even the team, it kind of all played out in that first half and the prediction we had of an upset. and then Or a, a blowout. A blowout. Or, yeah, a blowout in that situation. And it was coming to fruition. I think we watched the game together, and as a fan, and you know, even see tweets kind of flying out at the time of the game, it felt different. The, the entire game, you know, the first half and like maybe the first possession of the second half felt different. It felt like this Iowa team had explosive runs. It, it could throw the ball. It had RPOs. The offense like kept Iowa State off balance and the defense was suffocating. I mean, not even a first down, a third down conversion until the third quarter. And to have it flip so quickly as a fan, as someone who was predicting that game, it was just obviously heartbreaking and one of the most like biggest heartbreaking losses I can remember as an Iowa fan. But just more so just surprising how Iowa just never made a play and how many dumb and just critical errors we had during that game. I think you can start with, you know, the first one with the Cade interception to start the second half. So I didn't actually hate the call. I think what you're trying to do is capitalize on the aggression of a, a team that's, you know, in a weak spot. They're down 13. They haven't really been able to stop your run. I think everyone on the Iowa State side thought that a, a power run was coming. That's where had, Iowa had all their success early. If you're going to try and upset their system, you're going to try and make a play to get back into this game. It was likely going to be through an aggressive action there. You saw at the start of the fake, they did come down. Their safeties did come down with them some pace. Uh, Cade got on the edge cleanly. You know, that's really what you're worried about with boot action. If you can get to the edge cleanly, you have to hope that the QB makes the correct decision. You had, it just was far too long developing, but you had Lachey moving on to a drag until wheel route. Mm -hmm. The backside corner... Had some action that could have ate him up. He had, you know, Caleb Johnson kind of sliding out there, but no one else really eating him up. He, the fake just ended up not really impacting him. And the backside safety also stayed on it. So what Cade went to was a backside shoulder throw. Which is the sad not- part is, is that he could have, Lester had a built in check down for him. If he checks left earlier, and granted, this all happened in a blink, but if he checks left earlier, he has Caleb Johnson for a check down that usually goes for like six or seven there. The decision to just chuck it. And, you know, on a first and 10 when you had the lead and you're not, this isn't a pressure situation, that's going to be reviewed for, you know, the rest of the season. It's gonna, it was just the, the, the changer of this game. You had an opportunity. Even if you stall out there and say you you run it back, run it back you might be able to execute another pin. At worst, you're backing them up and forcing them to drive the field when they haven't run the ball. And and they just are still lacking momentum. Mm-hmm. That, but that, that uh, from the beginning, flipped the momentum of the second half. Yeah, and I, I reiterate it. I think it's, it was a good call. I, I love the aggressiveness. I liked, you know, trying to capitalize on them being in a desperate situation. I mean, at that point in the game, Iowa State is back against the wall. Their defense coordinator is probably just trying to action something to create a turnover. But the moment you see the backside safety stay, it's the entire play. It, you're trying to create a flowing action to the right, to try and drag the defense. That's a double fake where you have a run, then you have a, a cl- similar to the Gill touchdown where you're kind of having this flowing action to the right. If Cade sees the safety, stop right there. And, and rather than stopping, he ended up trying to throw a back shoulder, as you mentioned. And that's just just trying to make too much of a play. Like we, we always said, like, we wanted to play point guard this year, and you're, you're trying to be LeBron James in that moment. Just scramble for two yards, get down, and just live to fight another day. You're up by 13 with in plus territory. Yeah, but let's uh, let's start back at the beginning of the game and just break down you know, how Iowa attacked, how Iowa State answered, and just you know go through the kind of that flow. Iowa came out really aggressive in how they attacked. You know, they had play action sets that attacked the middle of the field. That's what we wanted to see. I think that's how they had it their way, and they didn't get so tight in the second half. That's where the action should have kept on developing. Caleb Johnson's first touchdown run. Really liked the design on it. We talked about it last week where they came out in that five wide, and then uh, or they came out in you know heavy, then motion to five wide to get a base. They did the opposite this this game where they went to five wide to get a base look, and then went back into heavy. That essentially calls off any 
uh, edge blitzes. You're not going to have a defense coming out, out of a blitz out of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that clears up then a c- clear run. Dunker has probably the block of the year yeah, on their, their top the player. Eats up the play side linebacker. RVZ, you'll, you've seen the scheme already from Lester. I, I love it because it works in the RPO and also plays the corners technique against him where they come inside and actually sm- uh, crack down the safety. That allows for Caleb Johnson to get to the edge with pace. Corner reacts too late. He was the edge defender. And that's all really married together in what you are doing, you know, RPO, everything. Uh, and then just watching Caleb Johnson space, that's going to be a sustainable thing through this year. And, you know, obviously we're at a, a very low point. This is a valley within the season. It sucks that it happens in game two, mm-hmm. but there are a ton of huge games left in the schedule, and there is something sustainable with this, with this run game. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, we saw the, the same pin and pull counter concept, uh, you know, probably two or three times as well, where you're, you're throwing a pitch out to Caleb Johnson and you're actually running it to C-gap, and it just really screwed with Iowa State. We, we saw defenders getting to the second and third level against Iowa State for the first time ever. Lester also had really good screen passes and kind of backside motion, uh, backside action to, you know, plays you just don't see coming. I think the first Caleb Johnson, was the very first play of the game was a Caleb Johnson screen pass. It was one of the first ones. One yeah. of the first ones, and it was, they got very lucky. I think number 11, their D tackle kind of got flowed into the play. Or they just got kind of pushed into it. If he doesn't, you know, that play can go for 60. And it just the frustrating part is we clearly have a good OC. And you can mention the goal line struggles. He probably got too cute. I don't know if he got too cute, though. Because, I mean, the first and goal, well, let's just go into it because those are you know, really impactful plays. First and goal on the one, you ran an inside zone. I don't really like that call, but that's the opposite of cute. Mm-hmm. You know, you're running an inside zone. Pescuzzi just gets a late jump, doesn't get to the D tackle, and it's a four-yard loss. The Terrell Washington, you know, flip, that hits. If, if he doesn't stumble, he yeah. might beat Freiler to the edge, and we had the edge blocked up. That's really where you kind of have to go, though, in goal line. Mm-hmm. If you're in a second and four scenario, it's either you're going to have a really difficult pass. Uh, they do such a good job of gapping you out, though. I don't like the idea of just running at Iowa State in the scenarios, trying to get around them. I think that was a good call. I was synced up really well, like a hit. Perfectly. Yeah, and that's that's what we saw from the, that Gill reverse that got us down on the other uh, goal line where we failed to score. But that was another really well synced up, you know, quick action. Everyone has quick action to the left, and then you had Gill coming around, and he got a first down. I thought the calls were, you know, they could have been better. I think I think that first and goal, if that's, you know, if we're talking about Brian Ferentz football, that's probably a sneak mm-hmm. for at least two plays in a row. And they need to start figuring out how to uh, use a QB sneak with Kate in there. Yeah. I think maybe you even just, maybe you have a short yardage package for Sullivan or Marco. Because when you don't have that QB sneak available to you, that team, the team is very good at that running that play. They're mm-hmm. a tough group. The center play and guard play are plenty of size. You have to be able to action that, but they don't like it with Cade because he's a smaller QB. Yeah. It's kind of what you had with Padilla. And you actually did, it is kind of a, you know, there's not a lot of things that both games show weaknesses for, for Iowa. Like, I, I think it's at the end, like, we're going to be a very talented team the rest of the year and have a good shot to win. But short yardage was definitely an issue in this game, and short yardage was an issue in Illinois State. For the same reason that if you don't have a running quarterback and you go under center, you, you kind of become easy to guess because all they have to do is just kind of all out blitz you off the edges. And you you don't really have a lot of options at that point because they're not going to QB sneak him just given his health. So that's something like going forward, you, we have to be – we have to develop some other aspect to our offense that right now it's not going to be a, a consistent thing we, we can feel comfortable in a third and two or, you know, in a goal line set. Well, so. I mean, we can talk about the advantages of Sullivan in those sets, sets too. I think adding him into the system is going to be really important. I think you have to start, you know, giving him some drives – giving him a player or two here because you have to have, you know, have every play call in your ability. Not having a QB that is that teams are scared of and boot action really does hurt you when you're under center. Mm-hmm. And Sullivan would be that guy where if he could get on the edge with, you know, say a blocker in front of him, now it's 6'4", 220 moving. And I think that's why I like to see Sullivan be a short yardage QB is just because Cade isn't – that you don't really, K doesn't really offer a lot under, uh, you know, under three yards. Yeah, and that's, you need to do like, I don't know, It'll be interesting if Kirk actually goes for that. He doesn't like to use his backup quarterback because of injury concern. Like if you, Cade gets, obviously, he's been hurt a lot. Now you get Sullivan hurt in a, you know, a package play. Now you're down to your third stringer possibly. I think that's where he'll be concerned and why he won't allow it. But there's no reason not to have Marco have short yardage sets. With Given the struggles we've already had in this season, it should be a developed package 
throughout the year. We are happy to announce a new sponsor for the ANF podcast. The ANF podcast is sponsored by Eye Surgeons Associates, proudly serving Eastern Iowa and Western Illinois for all your eye care needs for over 40 years. Well, also, I think running out of shotgun on short yardage is you, the reason you see it so prevalent in college football because you can, you know, action RPL really easily with that three yard rule. Mm -hmm. Um, it just allows you to be allows you to guess when teams are being really aggressive against you. If, if someone's going to line up in seemingly a passive set and come aggressively at you, RPO is you know your way out. Mm -hmm. And also read option. You know that's another uh, aspect of being out of shotgun. You can you can use a QB in that fast. So I think I think they really do need to start thinking about that. But a point I wanted to make about the second half and Cage struggles. Our first down running in the second half was horrible. Mm -hmm. And I think that was kind of lost in the numbers. You know, Grant, we'll go through in some other plays that Cade made that were not very good. But when you're in second 11 and second and 13, second and 14 against this defense where they're dropping eight, you're in a horrible spot, especially when you don't have receivers that are getting over the field, over top of the defenders well. You don't really have, you know, dynamic running backs out of the backfield. And you don't have a QB that can scramble. That if you're going to drop eight, like, you really do need that QB, QB to occasionally just go grab four or five you up the middle. Yeah. And Cade is really limited in that, you know, second, long, third, and long scenarios because of that facet. Yeah, and I thought that's where we'd see, we mentioned the preview, I thought he'd excel in the situations of decision-making, picking up yardage, and it, it felt like he didn't have the confidence to take hits. You know, there's times where he could have scrambled and kind of stuck his nose in there and got three. And he always kind of kept his eyes downfield and tried to find that late, you know, developing route to make a throw. And all he needed to do in a lot of situations was just pick up yards. And, you know, maybe you don't get the first down, but I don't think we saw him take off one time to go pick up that extra yard. And if he doesn't have that in his, you know, bag going forward, then on third down and all these kind of plays that break down, you have to be extremely tied up in the college football game, which is given our receiving core and given the receivers we're throwing to on a consistent basis – that also becomes very difficult. And so what we need to see him grow in this, you know, Troy game and then the Minnesota, which well, he, our prediction is that he will start both those games. And Kirk is not gonna instantly flip the script on who QB1 has been, because you've been all through camp, he's been QB1 taking uh, first team reps. First two weeks, the entire playbook's developed about giving him good plays and developing a, a chemistry with Lachey and all of our receivers. The next two weeks, they're gonna try to build on that and give us better options to, you know, get in first and second down in manageable situations for third down. It's still going to be that aspect of our team. There's no reason to reset that right now with how you played, in my opinion. And people have different aspects about what they like about Sullivan, but in my opinion, they're going to still invest in Cade for the next two weeks. And you have to just regain his confidence. And that's what Troy should be. Troy should be, I have a hard time believing they're going to sit back and let us run the ball for 200 yards easily. They're going to go, let's make Cade and their receivers make plays. It's going to be another sellout game, similar to Illinois State. And he has a chance, an opportunity to regain maybe 250 yards again and multiple touchdowns. I guess we can break into a couple more mistakes that Kate had. The Caleb Brown ball, that one was incredibly frustrating because he chose to throw a lofted one rather than a dart. I don't know if he has a dart ball. I don't know if he can throw a 40-yard ball on a line, mm -hmm. but that's what was there. It was a really well-drawn up play by Lester. You had an isolated, I think it was a cover three match where a corner was falling Brown at the seam. The free safety wasn't supposed to get there in time. That ball's got to be over the free safety's head. Mm -hmm. If it's on time and on target, that's a touchdown, game game over. Uh, we saw Beck hit that throw to essentially uh, flip the game. Other than that, I didn't – I mean, the pick, obviously, to open up the half, I didn't see really a lot of misses outside of that. He scrambled a lot and wasn't able to find people. That's frustrating, but that's also the reality of playing an eight-man drop. Mm -hmm. If you don't find something early, that just – that. Those guys close in late, and we don't have athletes that just get open in yeah. backyard football. That's not that's not the skill set of this receiving core or our tight ends. Yeah, and I think what Cade will take away from this game and what he needs to build on is extend plays with your legs, look to run. Don't all like obviously everyone says extend plays, look to pass, but he needs to find those five and six yard, seven yard gains. That's the number one thing he has to do if you're going to have this type of receiving core and you know the reality of our offense. You have to pick up first downs with your legs on third down. He didn't do that. The entire game, and he had opportunities to. The second part is find Caleb Brown. If you look at three of the third down conversions that we didn't pick up, and it was when they would bring five man pressures and kind of man up on the backside and basically go one on one, but just in creative ways to get us our eyes in the wrong spot. Brown was screaming on three of them. 
And one of like two of them were touchdowns. Obviously, he found tried to find him on one. But early in the first half, Brown came across on a post and had a guy by three steps. And I think that's what Cade will see on Phil. He goes, oh, I, I have a one, a number one. Gill's clearly a good receiver. Reese Vanderzee clearly is going to be a good X one day, just kind of needs to get a little bit stronger. But Brown's your separation guy. If you want a guy that we're on third down and where my eyes need to, my first read, and maybe Lester can realize this too, my first read is this guy. My, what my setup play is this. He's the one where the play is designed to him, and he's not getting bumped off the ball. He's not getting at the top of his route. He's not getting bumped like Reese was. And I think that's, that's truly where in the Troy game, if we see him all of a sudden become the focal point of third and seven passing or maybe first and ten you know, passing, that's the leap we need to take. And I think another reason why, to, this is kind of going back to even the Sullivan-Cade argument, the best player on this team on offense is Lachey. Other than, I'd say, um, Caleb Johnson had a hell of a game and is making that point for himself. He's number one right now. Yeah. yeah. But the best receiving threat, on this team and an NFL tight end is Lachey. And obviously he had zero catches in this game, but for you think for 10 games in a row here, Cade and Sullivan, the biggest difference between them is throwing over the middle with accuracy. Sullivan just doesn't want to do it. It, it wasn't a part of the game plan at Northwestern. And when it was called, he just, he honestly just held the ball. If you want to use Lachey appropriately and use your best player appropriately on offense, Cade's the guy. And so I think that's where we're going to make an argument for the next two games. You had to give him an opportunity he has a huge game at Minnesota coming up where we're going to need him. We're not running the ball against that defensive front seven for like we did against Iowa State. That's kind of my pitch. Yeah, for, I mean, you're down to the last two games where it's like you get, if you lose to Minnesota on the road and you don't look good, move on. You have to move on. You know, start developing Sully for next year. Season no season will be over if you go if you drop Iowa State Minnesota to open up, and potentially you know, I could even see a Sully poll. I mean, uh, Sully getting placed in earlier if. Lester believes in his RPO uh, read option, you know, quarterback run game. If if Kirk is okay with that and Lester has, you know, a full set of plays for that style of offense, I'm okay moving to that because then that allows you – because Sully's going to be a better under center QB because of what I talked about with boot action. If you can get him on the edge, that's a real problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, but out of shotgun right now, Kate is definitely the better option because I don't believe in Sully's over the middle passing. Mm-hmm. I don't believe in his ability to process the defense either. But if you're going to become gimmicky back there, and third and seven is already a fake down for us right now, we're not converting third and seven, third and sixes, yeah. then Sully becomes a lot more palatable thing for me. Yeah. Then you're trying to just manufacture first downs. You're not really worried about the, the long ball. Um, but that's going to be some really low-scoring games if he becomes our starting uh, QB. And that's the argument right there. Like He definitely can, he can be more of an on-schedule guy, and he can do things at a high level that are simplistic. Yeah. But good defenses – that are well schemed and have smart defenders and have a good coordinator. Sully's not the type of athlete that if you put him in those situations, it's not Jane Daniels, right? Yeah, like he threw for eighty yards against Iowa. He played Iowa twice. Throw on the films at any point during that game, we're like, man, I wish this was our QB. This yeah. guy's balling. It it just was kind of like a backup Northwestern QB performance, and it's always easy to go for the backup QB, but. Like, it's just kind of the ceiling for Iowa is just not what it could be with if K can regain confidence and start playing at that level. And that's that's maybe a little hoping, a little hopium there for K to take that level next step. But I, I we've seen it in flashes in this season. Well, okay. I think the other thing I want to address before we move on to the defense mistakes. We are thrilled to announce a new sponsor of the ANF podcast. Next time you're looking for an all-inclusive beach vacation, Consider Via Puesa del Sol or Via Puerto Escondido, both of which overlook the Pacific Ocean and Ocotal, Costa Rica, providing an exceptional all-inclusive experience for your family and friends. Visit their website, linked down below, for more information or to reserve your trip today. We are still getting baited on strong side runs. Mm. Our strong side zone, you saw it two or three times where we line up in, you know, under center, three receivers right, or, you know, tight end, two receivers right. And Iowa State would give you a pretty picture. You know, no edge defender, limited box players. Everything looks perfect for us Let's us, us, us go take three or four. And then you the snap happens and they slant strong side and everyone crashes fast. Mm-hmm. And that's just a really frustrating thing because it, you have to approach these defensive coordinators. And I, I don't know if it's a Cade call. You know, if he's got two plays in his head, he sees, you know, strong side open up. We're just going to go out and hike it quick. Or if it's Lester just trying to grab two. 
but you have to assume that these defenses are trying to trick you, mm-hmm. especially you know late in game. Once they're starting to time you up a little bit more, uh, when they're down too, they're going to get more aggressive. They're not going to just let you take four. It's like kind of their worst nightmare at that point. I would like to see just a l- little bit more weak side rushes. Grant, mm-hmm. that's that's even you know you're calling that truly for three or four yards when you run rush weak side against yeah. an off defense. But if your goal is to stay on schedule and your goal is to possess the ball, having that weak side call in your game is going to be really important. I think that needs something that needs to, you know, be a bigger part of our offensive playbook. I've seen that, you know, be an issue now two games in a row. Mm-hmm. But moving to the defensive side of the ball, I mean, they opened up with exactly what we expected and why we call the blowout is because you were going to be able to, you know, uh, capitalize on a crazy Kinnick, the north end zone, force them into, you know, multiple uh, uh, false starts. Back throws a gigantic pick early. If you actually watch that play back, we, they run a motion where we try and base out against them. It doesn't get communicated to half the, uh, half the defense and they have a seam shot for a touchdown. Mm-hmm. Beck, if Beck stays front side, he throws a seam shot to, I think Noel was out there. He st- comes back backside early, stares down a receiver and Higgins just runs right to the spot. The run defense was incredible. I think outside of Asama run on their first touchdown drive that went for 10, I don't know if they had, I think they had, once they went to that back running back, it was a little scattered. They had a couple five or six yard runs, but overall, Herkett played a whale of a game. Mm-hmm. Probably the best defensive end rush defense game I've seen in a long time. Was playing a tackle a lot larger than him, but completely mauling him, really holding up on his own. Uh, Higgins had a whale of a game in the rush defense. Where it all kind of fell apart is, is two plays. And I, you guys are, are well aware of what the two plays are. They've probably been talked about ad nauseum. We're not going to belabor the guys. We've talked crap on this podcast about Iowa players in the past. It doesn't make us feel good the next day, so I, I don't want to harp on it too much. But for the Noel touchdown, we also have to eat some crow on saying Noel can't get over the top on us. Yeah. He got over the top on I'll, us I'll take I'll take credit for that statement. Yeah. Well, uh, I, think, it, I don't think you're wrong about it because it was two double moves. I think what you were trying to say is straight shots. Yeah, it's know. like a post route, you know, from the outside perimeter. You know, you, you just post somebody. Yeah. It was two really well one route run routes. And I guess I didn't understand how coordinated he was. Yeah. Like the, the fluidity out of those breaks is what he really was good at. Not truly that straight line, I'm just going to go by you guy. And I mean, you can talk about the, yeah. the deep so shot. So what, what you had was three receivers to the right. Noel is the innermost receiver. I think we're in a cover three match. Castro carries an out route to the right. Noel is carrying th- on a, a, looks like a seam shot. X knows he's on a two-way go. He's in cover three. Higgins is giving ground. Higgins gets to like seven or eight yards. That means X should really be at like 15 to 16 yards mm-hmm. and be waiting. Be, he knows he, he should know he's in a very vulnerable spot. Yeah, he's on. He's in a uh, center of the defense, single high safety. Uh, this guy has a two way go on him. He for some reason starts to sit down as Noel gets does. It's not even at Higgins that he starts to sit down and like break down, waiting to make his cut. Wait for Noel to make his cut. Mm-hmm. It's really just a poor play, and I think the reason he got pulled so fast after that is just the context. You're in a thirteen nothing game. They can't run the ball consistently. Oh, you're oh no, it's 20 to 7 game. Yeah, 19 to 7. 19 to 7. You're at 12 point lead. Yeah. But there's four minutes left in the third. They have not been consistent outside of one drive. Even if they can push this to the red zone, they're not running the ball. So that means you're you're playing another jump ball with Higgins. Hopefully you can break that one up. But that's a long drive. That's discovering more about their scheme. That's the whole game. You know, you're whole, one whole call, one tip pass. Yeah. You're you're in in Iowa's defensive sense. You're in the perfect spot. You get to finally play shell defense late in the game, wait for the mistake, at worst, burn some clock. That's mm-hmm. why you just cannot have a 75-yard touchdown. I think that's why the this uh, offense fell apart after that is things got super tight because we just made the mistake we never make. Mm-hmm. We never get beat for one-play touchdowns, especially when we have a two-score lead. Yeah. But what happened was it was a great two-person move, and you just had no out pace yeah. on a guy of a flat-footed, and it should never happen. Yeah, it's just you can't have that breakdown. I mean, you have legitimately as an Iowa fan, you and you've been if you follow the program for the last decade. I can't remember a loss up two scores with four minutes left in the third in a run disparity where you have a two hundred, you know, rushing data. They probably have fifty at the time. You legitimately at that moment when they take that first snap on that ball, it's like ninety nine percent chance you win that game. And I think the coaching staff knows that. Everyone knows it. It's especially the Iowa sideline where we're like we got them right where we want them. We've we gave up that one drive. We'll be fine. 
they'll they have to ex- execute seven or eight, ten plays on this one without a run game that's dominating. They're in a big trouble. And it just let the air out of the stadium. The sideline knew exactly what happened. We just gave up what we never do. And it's hard to evaluate. You know, we talk about evaluating Cade. We talk about evaluating Lester. We talk about evaluating the defense. And just kind of the rest of the game. Because as an Iowa fan, you went from super confident to like almost to the point of like arrogance in that moment to we're going to lose for sure. Like when that play happened, I think everyone in the stadium, every Iowa fan watching from home was, we're going to blow this game. Like we, that's something we don't do. It was like, so like shattering to the, almost like the culture of the program of like, that's just something we don't give up. And it just, if the entire vibe flipped and we never regained that momentum and it seemed like it wasn't going to matter. It seemed like, all right, we, we didn't pick up first downs. The rush game wasn't working. The defense still was like kind of on the back foot. Every other possession after that, I feel like we weren't kind of, and oh, everyone else was scared to get beat. Exactly. So you kind of were backing up a little bit. Yeah, you saw you saw um, TJ Hall like have get a corner for six yards. I mean, a, a curl route on him had six yards of cushion. Right. It, that just, was, it was it just flipped the system. And the frustrating part is is that you still were two plays away from winning. You had this critical breakdown in the biggest moment. And then you still, you bounce back. You just did enough. You picked up your one first down the rest of the game. And then you set up for a punt. Once again, if you're an Iowa fan, you're punting from midfield. It's 40 seconds left with no timeouts. You have generally Torrey Taylor in the situation. I'm literally going 99% chance win. 99.99. You, you never see a college teams execute in that situation, especially against Iowa. Well, then the short punt, is and then you and then you drop a thirty-seven yard punt. The issue too is that you took that five-yard penalty. Yeah, and I, I understand the guy's got a big leg, so you want to give him more space. But that's why I don't understand why he didn't uncork one there because mm-hmm. he had. I mean, it was a thirty-seven yard punt to the twenty-two. That means even if he puts a fifty fifty-five yarder on it, that's still at the five. So why didn't we just give him more free reign to let that one sail? and hope that it bounces in and maybe you pin him at like the eight. I think if you pin that ball anywhere within the 15, I think if that ball is down at the 12, I think we win the game. I think somehow that 22 yard mark and then open up with that 10 yard out, it kind of spooked our team. Mm -hmm. And now we can go, I guess, into the the fateful play. Yeah. Okay. I love Sebastian Castro played a hell of a game. Had two insane insane alley runs, massive hits. Uh, has made play after play, won us so many games in the past. Probably a fair player on the team. Yeah. And, again, just in, it doesn't make sense the play he made. Mm-hmm. You have a seven-yard out with 25 seconds left or whatever it was. It could have been, no, maybe it was 30, 30 seconds 30. at the start of the snap, 30 yeah. seconds left, and they still have 35 yards to go. Mm-hmm. You have a seven-yard out route on you that Noel comes out and shows you, yeah, you ate it up. Short side of the field. And it's short side of the field, but you ate it up. He was on him. You know, he felt like he could get his head around. Just understand the situation. You know, are they really going to throw a seven yard out with with 30 seconds to go in the game? Or is this going to be an out and up? And I think that moment of him, you know, he made the play to end the game last year where he got to, you know, be the hero. Mm. It just was a little bit of hero ball. And I think X was just a little bit of hero ball where it's, hey, we're the DBs. We make the plays against these guys. Let's go end it with our, our playmaking ability. And I hope it doesn't kill these guys' confidence and they don't play slow the rest of the season. But you feel like they're going to they're gonna need a couple of games to get their confidence back because those are two plays under Phil that they're just an unforgivable sequence. And you really you make one tackle on bounce. We saw what happened. You know, they make that big play and then they have a, a seven, like a five yard out to their... It's like a one yard out. A one yard out to their tight end and he gets tackled on bounce and all of a sudden, you know, 15 seconds are off and they have to spike the ball and kick it. Like mm-hmm. that's the that's the scenario you were asking for. Reality, is a yeah. single tackle that's not a first down and it's and it's uh not out of bounds. Mm-hmm. And I think I in hindsight, we always go man to man in these situations. I don't really understand the no zone. Mm-hmm. I, you're you're a very good zone team. You're a little slow on man to man sometimes. I know we played man to man great throughout that game when you're trying to catch tackle guys, but zones seem to be maybe the better option there. And Castro versus Noel. Castro's not known for man to man. No. Like you could go back to 2019 Minnesota, like in the last drive, he got beat twice. Like Castro in man to man's like been the target of like every single two minute drill ever. And you put him on their best man to man beater. 
it, it obviously you're just calling your base two minute drill defense, but just a tinge more thought there to maybe stake Hall or bring you know Lee on the field and put him on him. Just a more scatty guy in the middle of the field. You're putting a safety in the middle of the field. It's like the last guy you want. You generally want your best cover defender at the slot in man to man. He's got a lot more responsibility in that situation. And you might see that, you know, going forward. You could. Hey, it's a true dime look where you actually roll somebody down that's different. Um, all right, but I think it's time to move on. Mm-hmm. It, I'm guessing as an IO fan, if we're dropping this at Wednesday at 9 a.m., you've had Sunday, Monday, Tuesday of just inundated with Cyclone fans talking crap to you, you playing back the entire game in your head a thousand times. All these plays we already talked about, you've thought about and probably rewatched. Every article you've written has been negative. The key is if we win that game, let's say Castro just doesn't bite on that, tips it away, we sack him next play. You go, well, man, Kate could have played better, uh, but he wasn't third and long a lot, but that's got to improve. But the run game's incredible. But that's it. Yeah. That's the only thing you care about is that, man, the passing game wasn't there. We're Iowa football. What do we care about? Defense, special teams, running the ball. You're also, you're also playing a drop eight team where you were in second and long pretty much the entire second half. Right. I, again, I, I'm not trying to defend Kate. I, I, I think he played poor. He took some chances Without he should have taken. But it's going to look ugly in second 11, second 12 against that defense, almost against every team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, So, but just holistically, yeah. Yeah. look at it. If you win that game, do you? if you make one more play in that last few seconds, do your expectations rise from that game or go down? I think mine would rise. Lester has unleashed Caleb Johnson. And the one thing we wanted from Lester was, hey, how, how can you get our run game rolling? We just ran, Caleb almost had 200 yards against the Iowa State defense that we struggled to run for 90 yards in a cloud of dust every year. And we got to Lyman to the third level. And we did it in multiple quarters, in multiple situations. We had four, five explosive runs. We have a good coordinator. We have a good good offensive line. We clearly have a back. We have a good defense. We have a good kicker, punter, the, whole, the works, and a manageable schedule. It shouldn't change expectations because a couple bounces didn't go our way. And people, obviously, the first reaction is fire Kirk. Season's over. If you do that, you're going to miss out on this team. This team is still very talented. It has a lot of key elements that we need to be good, Is are great. And I think the it's going to take a while. You got Troy coming up. No one's going to care if you beat them 31-0. You got Minnesota coming up. All you have to do in, in our eyes as a podcast is just win that game. Find a way to pull it out. Don't care how ugly it is. But the real fan base or like the fan base that you kind of try to pull back in after something so devastating won't be back until Ohio State. I think that's if you want to go into that, what that needs to be done in that situation. But yeah, I think we can talk about, you know, three things to look for for the rest of the season. And we're going to try and keep this positive. This is, again, as you mentioned, Lester has something to him. Yeah. He's aggressive. He's going to, we need a better QB. We need more pronounced receivers within a system. That's no doubt. I think he can offer that. I think he, he's aggressive enough in his scheme to recruit those positions. You combine we're seeing from Caleb Johnson, you're likely going to see a, a transfer back. That's like, I could see myself in that role next year where you can have a really, you know, solid run game going forward as a program. If this wasn't teed up as like an 11 to one playoff season, I would feel pretty good about where we're at. That was a dramatic loss, but like, man, there's some pieces there that can really work and you're seeing an improvement from last year. But what we need to see, and this is sad to say is Iowa state needs to keep on winning. Mm-hmm. that if we're, we are going to have any chance of the playoff, I know that seems silly to say right now, but the pieces are there to at least be competitive in each game going forward outside of Ohio State. You're, you're going to have a chance at winning the game. The brass is going to be potentially a gigantic game at the end of the season. You need Nebraska to keep on rolling. If they can come in as a 10-1 a and one team, rank like eighth in the country, seventh in the country, that's going to be your marquee opportunity. The next is, as you mentioned, two weeks from now when you go to play Ohio State, that cannot be a blowout. That has to be a competitive offensive attack. You know, that, that's where, you know, we can malign Lester for being a little overly overly aggressive in this game. That's where it but comes back. Yeah. If it's Brian Ferentz walking in Columbus, Ohio, there's absolutely no chance we score more than 10 points, mm-hmm. maybe 13. With Lester and this, you know, you're adding more gimmick to it. You're adding more, you know, trying to catch people off guard. You're obviously starting to see the run game develop. There's going to be some glimpses there. Mm-hmm. And now you add in, Hopefully, a, an improved punting attack. Our punter's got to get better. He's got to you know, be more consistent. But the defense is going to be there. 
to be able to back up and defend the run and really lengthen out Ohio State's rushing attack. So it's going to be a really short game. And a turnover-prone quarterback. A turnover-prone quarterback, and it, they're going to have to execute in the red zone against a very good defense, and that's going to be a, a tough equation for them. If Iowa can keep that game close, you know, I don't expect to win, but if you can lose by seven points, mm-hmm. maybe even keep it under seven, you can lose by four or three, that's going to set up then for a potential run at the end of the season. Yeah. And this is, we're trying to sell some hope here. Mm-hmm. You know, Obviously, the run game is good. That's kind of an unquestioned thing now. Caleb and... A game and a half has nearly ran for 300 yards. Damn, damn near. I think right now he's 10 yards a carry. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. That's something that's sustainable. You were talking about you know being explosive as an under center, you know grinding out team. That's something that could really start to take uh, root later as the season goes on. The defense, although it had its moments of you know really struggling play. You have to acknowledge how good the defensive line is, how good the linebackers are behind them, and how good they are against the run. That's going to be a tough problem for any team going forward to handle. If we can have some more consistent and you know, team-based thought around you know, DB play, uh, they're probably not going to give up more than 13 to 16 points a game for the rest of the season. Mm-hmm. I, don't know, I, I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. Mm-hmm. It's as much as it hurt. I mean, I was. <laughs> That's why it hurt so much. Yeah, that's why it hurt so much. But I was in bed at 9 p.m. on sat on a Saturday night. Slept for 12 hours last on <laughs> last last night. Uh, it, I took it really hard because it was just one. Of those, I'm sure all the Iowa fans did too. Because it's just one of those moments where you had six guys come back on defense. You know, it really seemed like it was setting up for a, a really good season, especially in that first half. Imagine mm-hmm. if you could punch a couple of those in, taking a 17 point lead. Like you really could have cruised in that second half. Uh, and that's why it's so painful, but it's there's still a lot of season left to play, yep. and you got a really good team. Yeah. All right, time to do a quick Troy breakdown. Not going to get into too much of this game. Actually, it's a 3-3-5, three, three, three defensive tackles. Lucky for us, almost identical scheme or kind of set up to Iowa State. Obviously, I don't think they have the kind of the Heacock style of selling out and blitzing and kind of being timed up as they are. It's a new program, new head coach. They just lost their starting quarterback. Uh, and they only returned four stars from last year. And they're 0-2. They lost in Nevada and got controlled the entire game by Memphis. Similar to the Illinois State game, there's not really going to go into a, a massive breakdown. But it, as a wish list of what, if I want to have, like I'm not, early in podcast, I definitely kind of put my eggs still in Cade's basket. But if I don't see improvement in his, his ability to make plays when the play breaks down in terms of scrambling or just decision making, and if he doesn't develop a relationship with Caleb Brown in the passing game in the next two games. And it's just maybe that third and 10 just not there. It's not just not an aspect of our team this year. It's not going to be there in the third and seven game plan. I'm okay with moving on to Sullivan, but I still want to hope, hold help, hope that he can have those two qualities to him. Just getting more game experience. I, I, Kirk always brings it up and it's frustrating that we're trying to get this guy more live reps and get him going, but that is a reality. Like scrambling and making those types of throws is the most difficult part of this game. And watching yourself on film not make those plays, he's a smart kid. Like he's going to, add that dimension to his game. It just depends if he can do it for an entire game and do it in big moments against Minnesota. So that's where I'm, I really want to just focus in on is, can he make those adjustments against Troy? And that's the kind of the wish list behind this game. It's, it's focused on his play, which every single Iowa fan, and I'm almost uncomfortable about how it's going to be so focused on him. Boo Birds will be out quickly. He'll feel the pressure to perform quickly because he knows what he's been on online. It's a moment for him, and if he can overcome that, that's going to be a great, like, well, it's not going to be an easy situation. We can move on. Moving some picks. To sum up my week, Noel slow, not going to beat us deep. <laughs> I was going to blow out Iowa State. We lose. I go 0-2 in picks. <laughs> I might have the worst bet in the country. I took Michigan plus seven. <laughs> that was a 40-point line. Texas should have been favored by 40 from the snap. Uh, I'm bouncing back this week. <laughs> Iowa minus 20 and a half. Uh, Troy with their backup QB. Offensive struggle. Can't stop the run. That smells like 24 uh, nothing or 27-3. Alabama minus 15 at Wisconsin. Wisconsin's playing Alabama football. They're spreading you out. You know, dual threat QB, going to throw around our receivers. Uh, defense, we're going to run a 3-4 dynamic scheme. We're going to run man-to-man zone. We're going to like have this pace and space to both aspects of our team. And now you're playing Alabama. And they're like, thank you. You're not going to hold on to the ball and run power sets and try to control the clock and make this game short. You're just going to square us up and play Alabama football. Like, give me Alabama in that situation. They are bred, like recruited and made for this with a good coordinator. Like, I think they score 50, 40 in that game. And I don't see Wisconsin 
stringing together more than maybe three drives for 17 points. So. Yeah, Wisconsin just doesn't know what they are. Yeah. Uh, when I watched their first game of the season, you see them in that spread set where, I mean, you broke this down in our uh, preview last year. Unless you have dynamic out, athletes out wide and a really a playmaking QB, that's really the only way to uh, operate out of spread, mm-hmm. like that true spread formation. And all they really have is the, the wide receiver screen game. And that goes for three or four every time. Yeah. Like they're really going to struggle with offense until they can bring in that you know, three or four dynamic receivers. Yeah. I don't know if that's ever going to happen there. Yeah. I think for me, I'm just going to stick with the Iowa game. I haven't really got a chance to look at the other lines, but I think Iowa minus 20 and a half seems like a layup. They're going to really struggle to score against this defense. Their defense is going to come out pissed, mm-hmm. play really hard. I think Lester has shown that you know, maybe – I don't think Kirk's going to put the reins on him and say, hey, play more passive. I think it, there's gonna, it's a kind of an ethos of this team just keep on being aggressive from this offense. So I think we're going to put up points again, uh, and I think the defense is going to force turnovers. So I think 20 and a half is actually a, a pretty poor line. Again, I think it's going to be about a you know, 27, 30-point win. Mm-hmm. Well, hopefully when we're talking to you next time, it's a little bit better scenario. But yep. go Hawks. Yep, go Hawks. Go Hawks.